and Jordan. If you guys are, I can show you those handouts, and I'll I'll try and tape what I'm going to do as well. So so it, and really the the handouts, and and you'll see on this handout that I'm going to get to today, it kind of helps you out. And again, if you guys take chemistry beyond our class, uh, it can it can you know be something that's going to be we're going to be covered so so that's the plan also on the day of the final so we this is so sad so we've only got we got today we got tuesday and then i think our final i'll well, look it up i got it here so our final is a week from tomorrow jonah this is it we're almost there but on that day there's a uh, there's a resource period uh, on friday may 21st from 11.30 to 12.30, to me, that if you don't want to be here, you don't have to be here. And if you want to be here, you can. But uh, that period, if you want to come in. But the test starts at 12.40, and I do need you here at 12.40. I think this test, I think what Dr. Page and Ms. Kaylee said is that you've got to be here for an hour. And I think the test will probably take you close to an hour. And But but if it get, it's been an hour, so if it gets to um, – 140 and you're done then you I, am i right about this yeah that's not all done yeah and so and so but it, but if believe me if it takes you more than an hour and you want to stay up to 240 and that could happen i'll be here i'll be here and you guys can do that and that will be it and, and uh, so anyways that's what's going on so any any questions there on that okay so let me just quickly go through this and rex i think you were the only one were you here Carson on Tuesday. Last Tuesday, what was it? It was AP Spanish, wasn't it? Yeah. Did you have AP Spanish? No. no. Okay, so I'm just Rex again. I've recorded this. I'm recording today too. But what we're what this is about? This is about nuclear chemistry, and I didn't give you any handouts. Now remember, you can use your book, you can use your notes, you can use the worksheets. You can't use your friends. Though. Okay, I'm just I want you to be on your own when you do this test and that's going to be again the last grade everything else is in right now so you can see your grade other than you Mike we're working on getting you caught up okay so here are the problems in the book so you might want to make sure you know how to do those and so Rex again I've recorded this so you can look at this online but real quick review so this chapter is on nuclear chemistry so it's about the chemistry of the nucleus. And if you really think about a lot of bonding and intermolecular forces, electron configurations, ionization energy, all those were really about electrons in the outer shell. This is about the nucleus, protons and neutrons. And so what we dealt with, and again, I'm talking mainly to you, Rex, are nuclear reactions. This is a chemical reaction. This is what we dealt with for about two years now. It has been two years. This is a nuclear equation, and I think those that were here in class on Tuesday, this stuff wasn't that hard. Am I right? This stuff was way easier. But what happens in a nuclear reaction is radioactivity. There's really three kinds of radiation, alpha, beta, gamma. And this is why when you go to the dentist and you get an X-ray, you have to wear a vest. But it's a spontaneous emission of particles or energy from an unstable nucleus. And I said, I said that uh, element lead, and element 82 and thereafter, those are all radioactive. And some of the elements before lead were. And again, Rex, I know I'm going quicker than, you can write this down. And, and if you want to come in access, I'm more than happy to put this back up too. This was one thing I would write down. And this is, is in, our, in our book, which you guys can use your book on the day of the test. But these, again, so you don't have to memorize these, but a proton, a neutron, these are the symbols. And remember, the top number is the mass number, the bottom number is the atomic number, and the symbol is always matched up by the atomic number. This is an electron or a beta particle. Beta particle, this is the Greek letter beta. Here's an alpha particle, there's the Greek letter alpha. So. Again, this list is a list you don't have to memorize. This is where you can use your notes uh, for that. And that is definitely on the test that we'll take next a week from Friday. There are, I think there's five or six of where we'll be using these. And so to have these in your brain would be a good thing.
Okay, and Rex, I'm just going to go ahead and I can come back because we're going to have some time at the end. I'll, I'll let you look at these. Um, okay, and I skipped that. Now, this page we did, and again, Rex, I can look, you can look at, at my notes, but this is something, again, it's not hard. As a matter of fact, I think most of you would say, after we all this complicated stuff we have done for months and months and months, this is way easier. But writing nuclear equations, and so that is something that you're going to need to be able to do. So we did those, and again, there's some more of those in the book. And again, Rex, you can look here. As a matter of fact, I'll show you. I'll let you look at my notes here when I'm done. Okay, and then I skipped some pages. Just trying to get to the stuff I feel like the main stuff. I did talk about this briefly. This is the radioactive decay chain for uranium, and I talked about the history. Do you remember what I talked about with the history of uranium in Highlands Ranch? A little bit more uranium under the soil here, which means this byproduct, radon, because this is the reaction series. Radon's a gas, and a gas can come through uh, cracks in the foundation of your basement, and that gas can be can be harmful or dangerous if it's ingested. And that's why when you're buying a new home, when you're buying another home, that's always one thing the inspector looks for. Okay, and then Rex, this was all review. So this page here, and there's a couple of these on the test. So this was just like first order kinetics. Okay, and, and so you wanna make sure, and again, I can show you, Rex, what I've done in my notes, but you wanna make sure, again, a couple of those on the test, which again is all review. And that's pretty close to where we got. Okay, and then uh, we I talked about carbon-14 dating. You don't need to know how to do that. But I did do this problem, which was exactly, again, that first order kinetics. Okay, so that's where we were. And then I talked about the Shroud of Turin. Remember what I said about the Shroud of Turin? What did, it, what did investigations find? It was not the uh, it was not wrapped around Christ after he had been crucified, because it was dated. There was three different labs separately that found it to be dated about the 1300s. So, okay, so that's where we were. That's what we did on Tuesday. Okay, now the new stuff. The stuff. First of all, this I'm not going to go over. But this remember I said radiocarbon dating has was good for about 50,000 years but there there are some assumptions with that so one was the same amount of cosmic radiation coming in from space that that was kind of consistent in that there's no way to affirm that or not also the ratio of carbon 14 to carbon 12 in an organism to be the same as it was again i'm not there's nothing on our test about carbon 14 dating and there's also nothing about this this is about how to date rocks I always wonder, you know, Luke, I hear, okay, they say that this rock is 3 billion years old. I'm like, was there a newspaper or how did they know that, you know? Well, this is kind of how they do it. They do it with potassium and argon, but they use the same principle. They still use the first order kinetics, but this is not, other than doing first order kinetics problems, that is not on our test. This though is. Uh, so I, I would write this down in your notes. There is going to be one question on your test on this. When a new element, somebody should Google this, what is the most recent element? And it's no longer discovered. It is, uh, it is made, it's synthesized in a lab. And uh, like on this periodic table, which the class, again, when I retire, and technically I'm not, as far as I know, I think I'm going to be back here next year. So juniors, if you need anything next year, you feel free to come and see me. I'm going to be doing the same thing I think Dr. Page has told me this year that I did last year, which is I'm going to be here on even days, two, four, six. So I'll be here Monday, Tuesday, Thursday. This year, there was like almost 40 of you guys signed up for AP Chem. You guys are way more courageous. Next year, I think there were only 23. A bunch of, what a bunch of weaklings. I know. Yeah. How many other Did you tell them how hard it was? Did you ruin it? Maybe you did, or maybe. and you probably wouldn't be lying, right? Hopefully, you did tell them there were good jokes coming their way. Yeah, with all the hell of chemistry and having a an ugly looking teacher, you you did get good jokes. But but uh, uh, the plan is is I'll have one AP and two chem, so I'll be here. So if you need anything, 
But that L, that periodic table was given to me by the class of 2017. When I do retire, I'm taking that home and I'm putting it up in my basement. But if you look on our periodic table, it's actually that one. If I'm looking in the bottom right-hand corner, you see 113 NH, 114 FL, 115 MC through 118 OG. But technically, when a new element is now made, it's made in a particle accelerator. It doesn't happen that often. I'm not sure what element they're up to. Somebody should Google it and see. But technically, when it's first made, if you look on the periodic table that you guys have used all the way through the year, so I'm looking right down here at element 110, 111, 112, 114. You see UUN, UUU, UUB, UUG. I'm sorry, UUQ. Where that comes from is this. And I do have a question on the test on this. I don't know. This, to me, is kind of interesting how they do this. But these... <clears throat> Uh, uh, these are the kind of prefixes or names that go with these numbers. And so if we were going to ele or name element 113, so what I do is the one is um, the second one is um, and the three is try. So un, un, try it. And, and so what has happened since when they were first when an element was first made, again, they don't discover elements. And when they went to the moon, and I think two on Mars. Now, a human being hasn't been on Mars, but they have had rovers on Mars. And they examined the, the soil and the, and the atmosphere. And there's not new elements there. There's, they haven't discovered any new elements. But, uh, like, let's say 118. And now they've given them, like, 113 is NH, and I probably can't even pronounce its name. Diholium, probably named after some famous chemist. But let's say 118. So 118's name. So 1 un, 1 un, 8 ot, un un otium, which probably its symbol was UUO before they gave it a name. So if we name the element 180, so 1 un, 8 ot, Zero nil sounds like a soccer game. Un ot million. Okay, so that's how they go. When an element, again, is first made, produced in a lab, that is how, that is how they name it. And that is why, if you look on the periodic table that we've been using all year, that, how, that is how that works. And, and most periodic tables are like that. Okay. The last thing I want to talk about in the, the chapter on nuclear chemistry, so we had nuclear equations, we've got, again, this naming process for newer elements, is the difference between nuclear fission and fusion. So real quick, the, this is a particle accelerator right here. This is outside Chicago, Fermilab particle accelerator. It goes for many miles. It's like a racetrack. Kind of. It's a big building where they smash atoms together. Okay, the last thing I want to talk about because I have a question like this on the test, is I want you to compare and contrast nuclear fission to nuclear fusion, nuclear fission and nuclear fusion. So I'm going to kind of give you today, again, because we're just really trying to talk about the very basic things here. So nuclear fission is, simply put, it's the splitting of a heavy nuclear. splitting of a heavy nucleus. And again, on the test, again, I think it's the very last question that I give you. If there's a question about to compare and contrast nuclear fission to nuclear fusion. So this is what happens in nuclear fission. And, uh, and this is kind of the reaction I always use in doing this, is if I take uranium-235 and plus neutrons, plus a neutron. So what we do, what happens, what this process does in nuclear fission is to take a heavy nucleus, and there's really two main isotopes that I know are fissionable. And one is uranium-235, the other one is plutonium-239. And, and, and I today, I'm going to show you guys a little bit about rocky flats. And where rocky flats is, is I always, uh, sometimes I have seniors that, 
uh, decide to go to mines. And, and once in a while, it almost is like confuses me is they are always kind of disappointed they're going to mines. I'm like, mines is a world-renowned school. People come from all over the world to go to mines. And uh, I would like to see the uh, placement place and the average salary of people that graduate from mines. I'm just telling you, mines is an excellent school. Same is true Boulder. Boulder is a good school. Well, Rocky Flats is kind of between Mines and Golden and between Rocky Flat or between uh, CU Boulder. And I'll show you later today. But there they made in Rocky Flats, they used to, they don't do it anymore. They made triggers for nuclear bombs. But these are the two fissionable isotopes. Well, what this gives off is radioactive fragments. And I'm going to show you a couple of reactions here in a second. Plus more neutrons plus energy. And it gives off a ton of energy, and I'm going to tell you about that too. So this is kind of the basic reaction here. What's Ty Tyler and Lorik doing right now? I think they're Zion, Alan, they sound asleep. Um, so if we analyze this, uh, <clears throat> nuclear fission energy is released when large nuclei split into smaller nuclei. Uranium-235, plutonium-239 are the only economically fissionable isotopes. Now, these reactions here you don't need to write down, but here are just some more examples, okay? Uh, to note on nuclear fission, this is the reaction that occurs in an Avon. Atomic bomb. I have written down here in my notes, and I think I might have mentioned this the other day. This would be a good question to ask Miss 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 Lynch, Miss Franks, one of your APUS teachers. But uh, when they dropped, this was the this was the type of reaction that occurred at the end of World War II. An atomic bomb. The first bomb, Hiroshima. It was like August 6, nineteen forty-five, or something like that. Yeah. Seventy to one hundred and twenty thousand people died. It still amazes me, and I know I'm probably repeating myself, but do you know they didn't surrender? They didn't surrender. And, and at, you should ask again, Miss Lynch, Miss Franks, I'm kind of an amateur historian. I kind of like to read history. And uh, my understanding was the United States at that time, remember President Roosevelt had died, I think in the spring of that year, pretty sure. And so President Truman then comes on, the vice president, and he didn't even know this Manhattan Project was going on. But uh, they told him all about it. But he had to make a decision. And some people are critical of the decision to drop the bomb. Well, they were planning, the Americans were planning to do an invasion of Japan that was going to be a million men, a million men. And just think about the cost of life there versus this. But they didn't surrender, so they had to drop a second bomb. And that killed 130 to 200,000 people. So... All that being said, so but they also use this reaction for uh, to create nuclear energy. And I'll talk a little bit about that. Uh, one other thing too, most of the uh, just kind of factoids things. Most of the uranium that's mined, some of it underground here, is uranium that weighs two thirty eight. If we look over here on the periodic table, we look at uranium's weight. Uranium weighs two thirty eight. Most it's it's most abundant isotope. And so less than 1% is these uranium-235, but what they can do in this thing called a breeder reactor is they can make plutonium-239. And plutonium-239 is very unstable, very, very dangerous. But, okay, but they do use it in nuclear energy. Okay, so let me just go through a couple slides here. On this slide, the only thing that's important is this right down here. Okay. Why do they use, like, uh, here, I'll show you this. I'm kind of jumping around. I'll come right back to this. But this is a, this is a uh, showing in 2001, so 20 years ago. But look at the amount of energy, the, per, the uh, percentage of energy. So this is for heating, for lighting. Look at this, Lithuania and France. 
high 70% from nuclear energy. Okay, uh, Belgium, the Slovak Republic, again, over half of the energy they use. So there, there's a lot of places, a lot of countries that are using it. The United States, not, not so big. But why do they do that? What are the advantages? What are the pros? What are the cons? And one of those is right down here. So here are, here are the pros and the cons of, of nuclear fission. So the pros and the cons. This is always a debate. But the pros is, is you get a lot of energy from a little bit of fuel. And look at this, this fact down here. One ton of coal, one ton of coal produces eight times 10 to the seven joules. Therefore, one mole of uranium-235. So compare that, one mole. So 235 grams versus one ton produces the equivalent energy of 250,000 tons of coal. That's why those countries use nuclear energy, because they get so much energy from so little. And there's plenty of uranium. And again, the, the more abundant uranium, the uranium-238, it itself is not fissionable, but in these things called breeder reactors, which are kind of controversial themselves, they can breed or they can make uh, plutonium-239. But there are cons, and one of the, the big cons is the disposal of the waste. So, and, and what that is, is this right here, radioactive fragments. What do you do with that? And it's like, so let's say I'm up here doing some problems and I got some paper that <clears throat> is scratched on now. So I just take it, I put it in the trash can. The custodian comes tonight, he or she puts it then out <clears throat> in the trash can outside. They come and take it away. They put it in a landfill. Nobody's harmed. Well, this is if you're exposed to this, and some of these have half life some of these isotopes, have half-lives, short half-lives of, of minutes <clears throat> or hours, but some of them have half-lives, meaning they're radioactive for tens of thousands of years. What do you do with that disposal of waste? Well, in the United States, back when Ronald Reagan was the president, so back over 30 years ago, the plan was to bury the waste north of Las Vegas about an hour, and they never have. So all this waste is just sitting at these nuclear power plants. In Colorado, we do not have a nuclear power plant. We have natural gas. But in the eastern United States, on the west coast, they do have nuclear power plants. So what do you do with the waste? And another thing is the fear of an accident. And today, I want to show you, I'm just, again, I want to still teach you guys some stuff, but I, I will stop and I'll talk about, show you a couple little videos on Rocky Flats. And on Tuesday, I'm going to show you a couple things on Chernobyl. Okay, and the problem here is that this, this reaction produces neutrons, but it also uses neutrons. So there can be a chain reaction which can get out of control. And actually what they put in the reactors are these things called a cadmium. Cadmium element number uh, 48 will absorb neutrons so they can control the reaction. Well, at, at Chernobyl back in, I think it was 1986, they lost control. And we'll talk about what happened there and even what it's like there today or i'll show you some some youtube videos on that so that's that's nuclear uh fission so this is a reaction that again here's a i don't want to spend time but that's how a nuclear reactor works talked about this hazards of nuclear energy where do you put the waste this again is a place in nevada where it's proposed to put the radioactive trash you got the mountain nevada um and then accidents, Chernobyl, and then this is the reaction that occurs again in a nuclear bomb. Okay, now compare that to nuclear fusion. Okay, and, and uh, fusion is the combination of two light nuclei. So just looking at this again to compare and contrast, well, fusion is when you take a light nuclei and you combine it. And this is always the reaction that 
I always write down in first year chem. And for us, if you write down this one, this one works. The other ones are, you can write down too. But there's so there's difference. Okay, so fission is taking a heavy nucleus, bombarding it with a neutron, and it splits and it gives off tremendous amounts of energy. Fusion is taking two light nuclei and combining them. And if you look at this, like these two here, and you can see the ones I've got up there, these are isotopes of hydrogen which are heavier than normal. Mr. Wood, yeah. can you lower the camera a little bit, please? Yep. So these are isotopes of hydrogen which are heavier. So when they talk about heavy water, they're talking about water that has these isotopes of hydrogen. This actually gives off more energy. Fusion actually, so how are they the same? They both give off tremendous amounts of energy, but they have different chemistry going on. This actually is a reaction that occurs on the sun. But the problem with this is this requires millions of degrees of temperature. To get this to go. And there was actually a story, and it was probably 25 years ago, something like that, but there was two scientists at the University of Utah who thought that they had discovered what was called cold fusion. Because if you can figure out this as an energy source, which I don't know if they ever will, my lifetime is of course not nearly as long as your lifetime now, but in, in my lifetime or in yours, if they'll ever figure out this this concept of cold fusion, it could kind of change the political dynamics of the, of the world. Because if you look at this, there's no radioactive waste. You're using hydrogen, which is in water, so you've got an abundant supply. So there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of availability there. So, but it requires hundreds of millions of Kelvin to overcome the nuclear electrostatic repulsion. Remember, light charges repel. So to get this reaction to occur, they have to combine. This is the reaction that occurs in an H bomb. Okay, this reaction here, a fission bomb, is what they used to finish World War II. And that, that guy that was wearing sunglasses that I showed you the videos on Tuesday, they were talking about these kind of bombs. Okay, But they have tested a hydrogen bomb. They, like the big, more superpower countries, but they never used it in a conflict. But it requires millions of degrees. So in a, my understanding, in a hydrogen bomb, what they use as the, to, to get this temperature is an atomic bomb. So the atomic bomb is kind of the trigger for the uh, hydrogen bomb to react. Okay, then here's some things about nuclear fusion. The advantages, there's lots of available fuel. Water, hydrogen. It's 70% of the planet. So there's lots of available fuel. It's relatively clean. Like up here with fission, there were radioactive fragments. That's not the case here. So they don't have the issue of disposing the waste. But the, the negative here, the con, so there's advantages, is the technology. The issue is, is it requires such high temperatures that the energy that needs to be put in is not going to really make it feasible for the energy that you get out. One thing I've always wondered is, you know, the government, if they would do some kind of an incentive program for businesses, for universities to do research on nuclear fusion and to figure out how to get that to work. And, and I know Princeton has done some research on it as well. So here is a hydrogen bomb. Uh, again, never been used in a conflict, but this is actually a hydrogen bomb is more powerful than an atomic bomb. Um, this is a controlled fusion for, for nuclear energy. There's this thing, it's called, it looks like the word tomahawk. Okay, so I'm going to stop there. So that's going to, in terms of chapter uh, 21. But I do want to move in here a little bit into chapter 20, 22.
Okay, so switching gears here. Ryan, can you see that? Yes. Okay, organic chemistry. So, so again, barely touched on some of the basics with nuclear chemistry. Okay, now organic chemistry. So, depending on how you guys did on the AP test, the next class you would take beyond our class in terms of just chemistry would be organic chemistry. So, technically, as a junior, because we don't have any, we, this is it for us. I mean, we have ChemCom, regular chem, and, and AP chem. And so you guys have climbed the hill with chemistry. But if you guys wanted to take organic chem next year, you could. You'd have to go to a university to do it. And uh, the, <clears throat> the, the district would pay for that. So I'm just throwing that out there if you want to, uh, to do that. Now, I'll tell you, because I, I got a BA, not a BS, but I got a BA in chemistry. My first year, I did what we have done this year, but at a college level. So I'd be really interested, you know, when you guys, you know, you go to college and you come back like Luke. I don't know if you took chem or not. Did your did your sister, um, did she take chem? I wonder how it went. She's got two. Emily's got two right now. So I, I'd just be interested. I, I, of course, it's always my hope when you guys get in there, uh, if you take it at a college level, you go, you know, gosh, a lot of this stuff we've already covered, you know, and obviously some of it will be new, but, but that's first year chem. So you do three hours of lecture, three hours of lab. So you go Monday, Wednesday, Friday for like an hour of lecture. And then you go for a three hour lab on Tuesday, Thursday, five credit hours. You do that the whole year. I don't know if Seth did that. He did. What's he, he's majoring in like mechanical engineering or something like that. And, I, and hopefully it went well for him. He's now, he's a sophomore. He's finished sophomore. And Emily's finishing her freshman year. Yeah, but you're going to spread it. We're not going to go into the junior. Nice. But then second year, second year, you would take a year of organic chemistry. This is if you're somebody that's going into the medical field, going into engineering, mechanical engineering, like Luke's brother, uh, or like biomedical or or something to do with that, or engineering, or chemistry. And so second year is organic chemistry. Same deal, three hours lecture, three hours lab. So Monday, Wednesday, Friday, three hour lecture, three hour lab on Tuesday or Thursday, five credit hours, 10 credit hours for the entire year. And some people that have had organic chemistry, that, I bet Seth didn't have to take organic chemistry. Yeah. Uh, Especially more if you're going into a medical field, you will. I actually really liked organic chemistry. I thought it was it was my favorite class in college. As well as it sounds, some people have probably told you it's like awful. I will tell you, I will tell you that in our class, so many times we always would get out the calculator and we would calculate over and over and over again. That never happens in organic chemistry. Never once. It's more kind of a learning style, like in biology, where there's memorization knowing processes, knowing reactions. Uh, and then just real quick, so then what I did in my first semester junior year is I, I took analytical chemistry, which again was lecture and lab for a semester. And then my second semester of junior year, I took, I think to me was my hardest class, which was physical chemistry, no lab, but it was kind of calculus and chemistry and math and chemistry. And then senior year, I took biochemistry and I did the same thing, lecture and lab for the whole year long. To take biochemistry, you've got to take organic chemistry. You cannot take biochemistry without taking organic chemistry. But uh, organic chemistry, so so in you know 15 minutes today and in a half hour on Tuesday, obviously I'm giving you the very basics. But I think to me it's kind of cool, and we since we have some extra time. Again, if you guys go into one of those fields, at least, you know, some of these handouts I've given you, it might be worth just setting aside and when you get into, you know, college, you're getting these out and at least have a little bit of a starting point. But chemistry, organic chemistry is a chemistry, the study of carbon-containing compounds. I have in my notes, there are 16 million organic compounds, so a huge number. Of course, when I go to the grocery store, I never get any organic foods you can tell but or what does it mean organic foods 
Uh, it means they don't involve synthetic inputs like pesticides or chemical fertilizers, but it's all about carbon. So if we go back to the dot structure of carbon, remember carbon has four single dots. Remember we talked about the hybridization of carbon into sp3 and the promotion and all that happened. But the key is, is that carbon can form four bonds. And so it can make these huge long molecules. So I want to show you again some of the vocabulary, some of the way that this works. So if I ask you to represent C4H10, so we go into our knowledge getting through and again, I, I, I'm always hopeful for this, but when you guys get done and if you take chemistry beyond our class in the college level, if you choose to do so, hopefully you'll say, man, a lot of what we did in there, we did in AP Chem. And, and, and of course, being at a college level, it's going to be a higher level and there's going to be stuff that we didn't cover. But if we did the dots for C4H10, so I've got four carbons with four single dots. And then I put 10 H's around here. So there's one, there's two, there's three, there's four, there's five, there's six, there's seven, there's eight, there's nine, and there's 10. And then we're like this. And so the most common way to represent that is that way right there. But in organic chemistry, there's actually multiple ways. And again, if you do get to where, and even if you guys say that, you know, you do really, you did really good on the AP test, hopefully you did, and you get your results back, and you got a good high score in the AP test, and when you go to college, and you want to major in one of these science things, they may give you credit for a semester or a year, and you may go, boom, right into organic chemistry. Well, your professor, he or she, will and you'll have to see what they say, but all these are equivalent. All these mean are, are writing the same thing. So you can write this C4H10, this is called butane. You can write it like this. You can write it like this. You can write it like this. And this way also, because it's assumed that these carbon chains are surrounded by hydrogen. So the main thing in, in organic chemistry is these things called hydrocarbons, hydrocarbons. So it's hydro for hydrogens and carbons. And so that the assumption here is that this is just surrounded by hydrogens. And then even this, and you go, man, that looks just like a squiggly line. It looks like a mountain. Well, in, in chemistry, organic chemistry, where it occurs is a carbon. So all of these, and again, when you guys go to... Uh, when you when you go to college, you're, or if you take if you were to take this class, organic chemistry, your professor would he or she would show you what is expected. Okay, and there's two main big categories: saturated hydrocarbons and unsaturated. Whoops, I'm sorry, I got one ahead of myself. Saturated versus unsaturated. Today, and again, I want to do. Because I still want to go a little bit longer, not too much longer, a little bit longer. And I want to talk today about how the naming of saturated hydrocarbons work. And saturated hydrocarbons or bonds are all single bonds. And then what I want to do on Tuesday is I want to go over naming unsaturated hydrocarbons. So what we'll do today are all single bonds. And then what we'll do on Tuesday is when we have double and triple bonds.
Okay, here's another little factoid thing like uh, so monounsaturated would mean one double bond, one single or triple bond. Polyunsaturated would mean two or more. But in eating foods, if you look at labels, polyunsaturated foods, polyunsaturated foods are, they lower the risk of heart attacks. So foods that have more double and triple bonds. Examples of those are nuts, fish, leafy greens. Those are healthier for us. Okay, now here's another list that might be in our book, but it's worth writing these down because of the prefixes. So what we're gonna work on today is naming uh, alkanes. These are all saturated hydrocarbons, meaning all there are are single bonds. I used to remember what IUPAC means, but it's like the international naming. Okay, so these are the names, and what's important here are the, uh, like one carbon will always have the prefix METH, two carbons ETH, three carbons PROP. And since these are all saturated, they're all, meaning they're all single bonds, these are all in and in. So I, this would be a good list to write down. <clears throat> It's all based on the amount of carbons, right? And a lot of them you would know, like five carbons, pent, six carbons, hex, seven carbons, hept, eight car or carbons, octane. what you'll see is when there's and i'm going to show you kind of the next thing here which is we're going to be naming these hydrocarbons like i'll show you here's an example so when you guys when we go get gasoline for our cars i hear that's not easy in some places in our country right now get gasoline for our cars but uh we put in octane and this is the chemical formula actually for the octane uh and when you think of octane i gotta look at this when you think of octane, so this right here is, is octane. It actually burns better. I'm going to write my note. Octane rating in gasoline. This is called, it's, it's kind of its uh, common name is called, called iso-octane. And I'm going to show you the name of this here, the technical name to, to uh, do this, but if you guys go like like what I always do when I get gasoline, I always get the regular. I don't know about you; it's the cheapest one of all. I don't know what your parents, what you guys put in their car. My uh, years ago, my in-laws used to live. I love my in-laws, but they lived in near Philadelphia, kind of about an hour west, out in Amish country in Pennsylvania. But my sons were then kind of middle school, and we said, hey, let's go to the Pro Football Hall of Fame. So we drove all the way across Pennsylvania to Canton, Ohio. The Broncos used to have Hall of Fame players. We don't have too many of those anymore. Vaughn Miller, he's at the end of his career. But uh, but we, my in-laws had this old beater station wagon, but they had, we had to put in the premium unleaded. 
Oh gosh. <clears throat> but anyways, the gasoline burns better when it's branching. They call this branching. Uh, and the way it works is is that like if you, I think what I put in there the rating is 85. And so that means there's 85% of this iso octane. And it's 15% heptane. So if your parents or you choose to put in a higher grade, the only time I put in a higher grade gasoline, don't tell anybody to do this, Rex, but it's when I'm going to get an emissions test. Okay, when I'm going to get an emissions test, I put in the 87 or the 91. So the 87% then would be 87% iso octane this and 13% and heptane. But anyways, that's how the, the ratings work. What do you do, Liza? What kind of gasoline do you put in your car? You're like me, cheap state, huh? Okay, so I'm going to show you guys. This This is the the longhand way, and I'll put this up. But now the rules and naming. But I always simplify it this way. So I'm going to just show you the Mr. Wood simplified redneck version for the, uh, the rules for naming, okay? And, and I'll show you kind of how I put these together. Number one, you find the longest continuous chain of carbon atoms. Mr. Wood? Yes. Can you move the camera so that I can see what you're writing? I will do that. Thanks. Can you see that, Ryan? Um, a little further, please. Yeah, that's good. Thank you. So the first thing, and again, we're going to do some examples today. We're going to find the longest continuous chain of carbon atoms. And I'm going to show you here in a second the, the long-winded rules. Number two, we're going to number this. And I'll explain the numbers, but what we're going to do is we're going to find the longest continuous chain, and we're going to number it where the where the branch group, where the branch group gets the lowest number possible. Okay, but that's what I was saying. Find the longest continuous chain, and then I number where a branch gets the lowest number possible. Okay, and then I do it alphabetically. When I name it, I do it alphabetically. And again, I'm going to show you some examples today. So do it alphabetically. Okay, and I'm going to put up here in a second. Hi, Mia. My, Mia, there's a couple handouts here. And, you know, I'm recording this too, so you can uh, all upload it to my, to my Canvas page. But uh, so I'm going to find the longest continuous chain. I'm going to number the change so the number of carbon atoms gets the lowest the, or the, the substitute groups get the lowest number possible, and I do it alphabetically. So if I go here, and again, I'm going to put up the rules, and I'll, if you will care to write them down, you can. But I want to find the long, and it doesn't, now, of course, we're always used to going left to right. Isn't in Japan they read right to left? I don't know. But here it doesn't matter or left to right or right to left. So here's a chain of five, but this could be a chain of five. I could go like this could be a chain of five. I want to find the longest continuous chain, but they're all five. So I'm going to make this my longest chain. So here are the branch groups. So the way I named this, this is how I named this. This is isooctane, but here's the actual organic name for this. So I go two comma two comma four. So if I can number the carbons, one, two, three, four, five. And then dash and then trimethyl, where the trimethyl, because there's three of them, and with one carbon, that substitute group is get, going back here. It was um, one carbon was methane, so methyl. If it's two carbons, it would be ethyl as the, the substitute group. It's three carbon propyl. Mr. Wood, can you move the camera again? Say say it again, Jonah. I couldn't hear you. What's that? The twos came from here. So the one, two, three, four. So off the second, so off the second carbon here and here, and off the fourth carbon was the branch. Okay, and I'm going to do a bunch, Jonah. That's a good question. And then finally, the 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 backbone name is pentane. So, so, and Joan, I don't know if I'm answering your question, but the twos come because off the second carbon, there's two methyl groups. 
And off the fourth carbon, there's another methyl. So trimethyl. So the reader reads, there's three methyl groups. Two of them are off the second carbon and one off the fourth. And then the backbone name is pentane. And again, I want to do a bunch of these. Let me put this up, though. So here, here are the rules. And I kind of, again, to me, if you follow the Mr. Wood redneck thing, this will really get us through this. Okay, so let me put this up, but I'll kind of show you. And if you guys want to copy this down or take a picture of it, it's fine with me. But what I did for my rule one, the longest continuous chain is I really put two and three together. So if there's no branching, it's named after the number of carbon atoms, but we're doing branching. Number three, if branching exists, it's named after the longest carbon chain. So the first thing we want to do is we want to find the longest continuous chain of carbon atoms. Okay, then we want to number the chain. And this is where kind of rules four and five go. So you want groups on the chain. I just call them substitutes. The substitute is saturated hydrocarbon. It ends in AYL. That's why this was methyl from methane, one carbon. If it had been two carbon group and it had been saturated, it would have been ethyl. If it had been a three carbon group, it would have been propyl. Four would have been butyl. And groups along the main chain are located and named by a number. And that's what Jonah asked about. And you number the chain so the first substitute gets the lowest number possible. So it doesn't matter left or right. It matters which, which substitute gets the lowest number possible. Right. So is the 2, 2, 4 part of the name? Yep, this whole thing. This, this Rex means the same thing as this. This is just the common name for that. Kind of like water is dihydrogen monoxide, but we call it water. Well, everybody's so familiar with this because it's used so much in, in gasoline and cars, they call it this. But this is really the organic name of that. Okay. And then punctuation, again, I'm going to do some examples here today, but you go number, common number, letter, dash, number. And notice what I did here. With the numbers, I did commas. And then when I go letter, number, or number, letter, I do a dash. Okay, so then, and then, and then, so I find the longest continuous chain. I number the chain where I get the lowest possible number for a substitute group. And then I name it alphabetically. So if I have a methyl group and an ethyl group, I'm going to name the ethyl group first because I do it alphabetically. Okay, and all that is just a bunch of words. We need to do some examples. And that's what those handouts are. Sure. Yes. Go ahead. What's your question? Turn it off. Turn it off. <laughs> Is it unplugged? Yeah. And it's still getting hot? Yeah. It's just warm. I have no idea why. <laughs> it should be on. Push it back. Push it away from me. I don't know why that was good. Okay. So I am going to... And, and if, if you guys want, I can put these notes back up but for right now. I'm going to turn these off. Okay, and Ryan, I'm going to bring the computer over here. Now, these, again, are handouts that I didn't put. I thought you were going to be here today, Ryan. You told me you were going to be here. But, but anyways, let me, let me come over here. Okay, so where I'm at, and again, Ryan, you can you'll get these handouts if you come by today during home uh, during uh, access. But and I'll have out, and guys, I'm going to leave out the answer keys. But here, and actually, if you look on the front of these, so I start here, and Ryan, again, I've got these handouts, and all your classmates have them right now in their hands, but. If you read the introduction, it's kind of a review. And I know some of you guys are going to be junior escorts, and I have some handouts I can give you today that uh, 
you might want to get today if you're not going to be here on uh, on Tuesday. Everybody else, I'm gonna I'm gonna get into unsaturated compounds. So we'll talk about double and triple bonds on Tuesday. But alkanes are saturated hydrocarbons. This is exactly what I just said. They can be unbranched and they're called normal. So the, the end. And then they can be branched. And I'm going to get into that. But first of all, we just have unbranched. So you can see right here. Now, remember I said, you're not going to turn into me these handouts, but I'll let you use them on that test. Okay, so, uh, and, and again, if you at some point are going to take organic chemistry, it might be something just to throw in the back of your notebook and try and remember when you start organic chemistry, at least this can get you through the first lecture, the first day in organic chemistry. So this would be in heptane, this would be in pentane. Uh, number three would be N-octane. This is when there's no branching. So can you see this, Ryan? Yeah, kind of. Okay. Well, again, you come in today, you can you can see this. And this is N-octane, and this is n no name. So that's easy. Okay, no branching. Those are are hopefully fairly easy. And it just means normal. Just, just like it says right up here. Normal, which I think Lexi is just meaning is just a straight line chain. Okay, so there that one hopefully pretty self-explanatory. Now the next page gets to where they explain branching. So this is, again, for those who aren't going to be here on next Tuesday, but for branched alkanes, the longest continuous chain, remember we're going to find the longest continuous chain, is the root name, and then the branch's name is a side group. So this here, if I find the longest continuous chain, and again, it's not always left to right, and it's not only the same line or horizontal. I go across, I go one, two, three, four, five. But if I go this way, one, two, three, four, five, six. So that's the longest continuous chain. And then when I number the carbons to Jonah's question, which was a good question, I number where the substitute group, so this is the substitute group, gets the lowest number possible. So if I go this way, one, two, three. If I went this way, I started here, one, two, three, four. So I want to go this way. I want the substitute group to be on the lowest number of carbon. So this is three dash ethyl. So that means off the third carbon, there's an ethyl group. So it's got two carbons. And then hexane, which is the which is the backbone name of the compound. Okay, so let me let me come down here. Okay, so for number one, so I want to again find the longest continuous chain, which this this place or this one, it's pretty self-explanatory. It's got to be right across here. And then, but, but my substitute group is right here. And it's got one carbon, so it's going to be a methyl group. But now I'm numbering this. I want that to be on the lowest number of carbon possible. Does it mean left to right or right to left? So I go one, two, three. If I go right to left, one, two, three. So it doesn't matter which way I go. So the name of this is 3-methyl pentane. 3-methylpentane. Okay, so, so what does that mean? Well, that means the ending kind of tells you the backbone, the chain. So a chain of five carbons, and off the third carbon, there's a methyl group, which means it's got one carbon. Okay, number two, find the longest continuous chain. So I could go one, two, three, four. I could go one, two, three, four. I could go one, two, three, four. But the point is it's four, okay? And then I want to number it where the substitute groups come off the lowest number possible. So I'm going to go like this, straight line across. One, two, three, four. So what I have here is off the second and the third carbon, I have a methyl group. So two comma three dash dimethyl 
computer. What's the name of that? Okay, so going back, what does that mean? Let's interpret that. We kind of start at the end. Butane, four carbons. Of the second and third carbon, there's a methyl group. That's diet. Okay, number three. So I find the longest continuous chain. So I go one, two, three, four, but I can go one, two, three, four. So four is the longest chain. Then, so I'm going to go here, and then I want to get the substitute group to be the lowest number possible. So here's the substitute group. Let's see. Yeah, you're right, Lexi, you're right. You are right. So technically, the longest continuous chain is there. And, uh, and so then my substitute group is here. And so if I number the carbons, I can go one, two, three, or one, two, three. So they're both three. So this is just three dash methyl and then pentane. Okay, number four, the longest continuous chain, of course, is right across here. The numbering, here's my substitute group. I want the lowest number possible. One, two, three, four, five. One, two, three, four, five. So it's both the fifth, so it doesn't matter how I look at it. So it's five dash methyl. And then it is uh, uh, no name. See if we can do five and six. Okay, so what I get here is um, two dash methyl pentane, and here I get four dash methyl pentane. Or no, that's not right. Not pentane. It is heptane. Four dash methyl. Yeah. Will there be any of any ones that are like three dash methyl methyl dash three dash methyl? Yeah, let's let me show you. Let me show you, Rex. Here, I'm almost done. But if I go to the next page, and again, I'm going to quit talking here. But here's some examples. So so we go up here to number seven. So here. So find the longest continuous chain. So off the second and third carbon, two, two, three, triangle.
Okay, so then if I come to number eight, so again, I find the longest continuous chain. I get the lowest number possible. So I have two substitute groups. So I have a methyl group, and here I have two carbons, so ethane, ethyl. So off the third carbon is the methyl, but off the fifth is methyl. But notice my last thing was go alphabetically. So you find the longest continuous chain, you number with the lowest number for the substitute group, but when you name it, you go alphabetically. So even though the ethyl group is on the fifth carbon, you go, you, you name it first because of alphabetical. So five dash ethyl dash three dash methyl. Yeah. So next to your question, you can see yes. And then what I'll do on Tuesday is I'm going to get into what happens when you have double and triple bonds. Okay, so number nine, so again, the longest continuous chain. So off the third carbon and ethyl, off the five, fifth carbon. And I, and I, I have the other answers here. If you guys want to check them, 13, one, comma, two, dibromo. So bromine off the first and second <coughs> carbon. And then Here's what I'm imploring. So again, find the longest continuous chain, number with the substitute group having the lowest number possible. So if I read this, one comma two dichloro. So off the first, first of all, I guess octane, so I know I have eight carbons. So off the first and second carbon, I have hormones. Off the second carbon, the third, and two off the third, and one off the fourth, I have Thirteen says one comma two dash dibromo dibromo ethane. Fifteen is one comma two dichloro dash. Two comma three comma three four dash tetramethyl octane. And Ryan, if you come in and access, I can give you all this stuff. Okay. Okay, I'm gonna stop there. Uh what I want to do is again, I want to show you uh, and, and I've got if you care to. There was another handout, which was exactly the same thing, but the answer keys are all right here. They're all right here. And I'll have these uh, out today, or if you want to come look at them. Uh, during access or whatever, I have the answer keys for these right here. But what I want to do now is I want to just show you, just to learn a little bit about Rocky Flats.